the vice chair of the program committee this year, so it's my special pleasure, in fact, to introduce this panel this morning. Um, since Thursday, I don't know if everyone has been here, but most of you have been here, you know that we've heard a very broad array of historians, economists, politicians, and even our public uh, policy leadership winner, uh, award winner, reflect on the economic crisis and the environment. They all mentioned, in some shape or form, the environmental issue and its importance. Um, they noted it as an emerging problem, a huge problem of global proportions and complexity that we weren't really dealing with. The economic crisis was a jolt to the system, but what makes climate change and the environment different is that we can't focus on the moment things went horribly wrong or on the weeks of the market shocks. This crisis is insidious and slow, and you can't even say glacial anymore. It worsens over decades. Um, and yet, we don't act, nor do our politicians. So in this, in this panel, what we'd like to talk about is um, how do we deal with the environmental issues after the economic crisis? Do the stimulus packages actually help us develop the green economy we hear so much about? Or were they wasted opportunities, reflecting on our theme of watershed moments or wasted opportunities? And what should we do about energy issues? Can't talk about the environment without energy. So to help us learn more about these issues and perhaps uh, uh, unravel some of the problems, we have our three panelists today, and I'll just go over them, their, uh, their names and their backgrounds very, very briefly because you all have their bios in your packages. With us first is uh, Thomas Homer Dixon, or TAD, who is the author of The Upside of Down and uh, The Ingenuity Gap, which won the uh, Governor General's uh, Prize a few years ago. Uh, Professor Homer Tada holds the uh, Center for International Governance Innovation Chair of Global Systems at the Bosley School of International Affairs in Waterloo. Quite a mouthful. <laughs> uh, he also contributes frequently in the national press, in journals, and in major conferences, and most, re or most recently was the Mannion Lecturer in Ottawa. The second speaker we were uh, happy to have with us is Velma McCall, who's a partner in Ernst Cliff Strategy Group, one of the leading government relations group firms in the country. Now, Velma specializes in energy, climate change, and clean technology issues, and has served in many senior positions in the federal government and as an advisor to, to ministers. She is also the author recently of uh, two uh, articles about climate change, The Politics of Global Climate Change Deal, about Copenhagen, and then another article, Deconstructing Copenhagen, both of these in policy options. And then our third speaker, you might have heard has car trouble. Uh, oh, it's that energy crisis, right? The battery, actually. But anyway, Jeff Rubin is uh, the author of Why Your World is About to Get a Whole Lot Smaller, uh, about how oil scarcity will lead to the end of globalization, as we've been discussing it. He's also the winner, this book is also the winner of the 2010 National Business Award. Uh, Jeff is the former chief economist of CIBC World Markets and built his reputation on many successful um, uh, predictions over the years about the price of oil and uh, real estate markets. Uh, uh, he was named one of Canada's, or Canada's top economists a number of times and has also written in national newspapers like the Globe and Mail. Um, uh, I guess his column was uh, ahead of the curve. Anyway, it's our pleasure to welcome these three speakers. And you know the rules, or you know the, the format. Each speaker will have uh, 20 minutes, and then we'll have a bit of a break, um, and then get to your questions. So, Tad? Otherwise, the microphone will be too far away. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, this is my first time at Cooch, and uh, it's particularly pleasant because uh, it's, it's been an invitation from Wendy uh, and from the Cooch board uh, to participate. Uh, this is uh, a renowned institution that has had great influence on Canadian public policy over the decades. And I think we're going to have an extremely interesting conversation this morning. We've started it this morning uh, at the breakfast table. I don't think you'll find a huge amount of disagreement, but a lot of nuance and differences in our perspectives on these issues. Uh, I have to say that uh, on a Sunday morning, this is probably the, the segment of the audience at Cooch that is most resilient, most... <laughs> 
most interested and most dogged. I noticed that the proportion of people with gray hair, and I can speak about that because I have gray hair, in the audience is uh, probably higher than it would be on other days, uh, because I think, I think uh, the others were partying outside my window until about 3 a.m. this morning. <laughs> be that as it may, I still have, you know, some, you know, I had enough coffee this morning to sort of clear the cobwebs from my head. What I, I want to talk about during my presentation is, first of all, uh, whether I think the, the uh, economic crisis has created a transformative moment or a tipping point, in a sense, for environmental issues, in particular for climate change. And I'm going to argue strongly, strongly that it hasn't. Uh, secondly, I want to spend a bit of time uh, outlining a, a model or a way of thinking about uh, how change occurs in complex systems, punctuated change. And then thirdly, I'm going to spend some time, maybe just five minutes or so, uh, discussing climate change, because apparently a lot of people have mentioned it, uh, and I want to put some facts and data on the table. Now, I, I, I'm going to be using some slides, but I've been warned that I must stay away from anything with writing on it, so I think I've actually reduced that to a minimum. I have some photographs and some graphs, but data are important in this particular discussion, so I want to show some data. Uh, first of all, uh, has the economic crisis created a transformative moment for, uh, for environmental issues and for the challenge of climate change in particular? I would say quite decisively that it hasn't, uh, that it actually has had no positive consequence for uh, our environmental challenges and our public policy with respect to environment. And I would say that's especially true in Canada. And I think there are four reasons why this is the case. Uh, the first is that in Fundamentally, it was the wrong kind of crisis. It was an economic crisis, not an environmental crisis. And one would, you know, prima facie, reasonably expect that an economic crisis, if it's going to produce changes in public policy, would produce changes in economic policy, not in environmental policy. The only place where I think there might be an exception to that general rule is, in this case, in the area of green jobs, that uh, one of the responses that policymakers might have uh, proposed, and in some cases, many cases actually have proposed, to uh, boost demand, boost consumption, boost employment uh, in response to the economic crisis is investment in the green economy, in green jobs. And that's been particularly a public policy, policy focus in Ontario. But outside that, uh, which in some cases, and I think we'll hear from uh, later speakers, it's been uh, really quite marginal, especially in Canada, the concern about green investment and green jobs. I don't think that this economic crisis has been the right kind of crisis to produce a change in environmental public policy. So that's my first point. My second point is that um, uh, the, the, uh, in, in general terms, the public policy response that was proposed to uh, cope with the economic crisis emphasized a return to growth, uh, economic growth, uh, a conventional and fairly narrowly, fairly narrowly defined notion of growth, which involves borrowing enormous amounts of money, in this case not in the private sector or from home equity, but now from the public purse, uh, to maintain consumption and demand in our economies. So uh, we, we have a growth model that requires accumulation of very large amounts of debt, to maintain demand because our economies tend to produce, are very good at producing stuff in very large quantities. Uh, so we're constantly faced with a, a demand failure in our economies. And, uh, uh, and now we're trying to do the same thing. We had a crisis of too much debt and we're trying to solve the crisis of too much debt and too much stuff, especially in wealthy economies, by borrowing more money and producing more stuff. And, uh, and I think, in a sense, the current model of growth, and I'm not against growth in toto, but some notions of growth and current models of growth, the current model of growth got us both into our economic crisis, and it's demonstrably aggravating our, our environmental crisis, because it uh, tends to produce a steady increase in material and energy throughput and waste output from our economies. So we have a problem there, a fundamental premise, an addiction to a particular kind of economic growth that's doing us a lot of damage. My third point is that, um, more narrowly defined, it's related to the second, is that the, the, uh, the Keynesian policy response to our 
uh, economic crisis. Involved, and this is especially obvious in Canada, uh, generally an enormous amounts of investment in infrastructure that was carbon intensive or that, that sustained a carbon intensive economy. And in particular, I mean roads. We looked for shovel-ready shovel stuff, and the stuff that could be rolled out really fast was road construction. And I don't know about your particular part of Ontario or of Canada, but in my particular part of Ontario, uh, all of a sudden it was hard getting from one place to, to another place because there was construction everywhere. More roads, widening roads, ditches, uh, uh, drainage systems, sewers, um, but especially pavement and roads. The paving companies did very well. Um, this isn't the kind of investment that we should be having if we're concerned about uh, the carbon intensity of our economies. So that's my third point. And my fourth point is that fundamentally, I think, this economic crisis, and this relates to the economic public policy response as well as the environmental public policy response to the extent that there was one, but the economic crisis was just not severe enough. Maybe that's partly because we were able to, in our Keynesian response, pump in enormous resources into the global economy very quickly, uh, a huge exercise in moral hazard, bailing out a lot of the bad guys around the world, uh, and, uh, and, and stabilize things. But the cost of stabilizing things is that a lot of the bad guys and, and the institutions and banks and financiers uh, and, and other arrangements that created the problem in the first place are still in place. And, and probably in a few years, we'll go back to a lot of the same old practices. Uh, so there hasn't, I think, been a fundamental reconfiguration of, of the world economy and especially of the American economy that would be required to uh, prevent this kind of crisis from occurring again in the future. So wrong kind of crisis, uh, emphasis on return to an, a narrow definition of economic growth or a narrow form of economic growth, a Keynesian response that emphasized more carbon intensive infrastructure and ultimately a crisis that wasn't severe enough to really produce a fundamental reconfiguration of our economies. And the result, I think, is that uh, I think it's questionable whether the environmental crisis has been, excuse me, the economic crisis has been a transformative moment for even the economy, let alone for our environmental policy. I would say it probably hasn't been a transformative moment for our economy. And it certainly hasn't been for our environmental policy. So that's my argument about uh, about the relationship between the economic crisis and our environmental challenges and environmental public policy. However, I want to say that I happen to think that major change in human history, in fact, major change in just about all complex systems in human societies or complex systems, occurs uh, in a punctuated form and is almost always mobilized or catalyzed by crisis. So that brings me to my first slide, crisis and change. See, not too many words. <laughs> I do, however, have a laser pointer. So uh, the idea here is that um, as we move into the future, as any complex moves into the system moves into the future, uh, it, it is in a, a situation, philosophically speaking, ontologically, if you want to use the fancy word, uh, of, of sort of embranching space-time. It can go down a lot of different routes. And what determines the moments at which uh, these routes branch apart is shocks of various kinds. So here's a shock, and here's a shock, and here's a shock. And it's at those moments that there, in a sense, are options available in, uh, to the system to change. Uh, the phenomenon is path dependent, to use a, 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 a very important term that comes out of complex systems theory and economics. In other words, if, you'd, if the system sort of goes right here and left here and right here and ends up down here, uh, it can't actually sort of decide at this point that it doesn't like where it is and wants to go over here. It, there's a lock-in phenomenon. The history matters, and what happened in the past determines where the system is right now, and you can sort of revise that history and go somewhere else. So there's path dependency. 
And here's the critical point. Each one of these shocks is what I call a moment of contingency. It's a moment at which there's flexibility in the system. I think it was Paul Romer, the economist at Stanford, later picked up by Rahm Emanuel, the chief of staff in the White House, who said, don't never let uh, a good crisis go to waste. Well, there's a certain truth to that. The idea is that at a moment of crisis or shock, in this case, the economic crisis, that there are opportunities to do things because received wisdom has been discredited. Uh, special interests who promulgate the received wisdom about the status quo have been discredited. And so people are prepared to consider alternatives. But these are also moments that are extremely dangerous because these are moments when, in particular, extremists or extremist groups uh, can be active and can push, say, a social system in particular in, in a direction that could be extremely dangerous for, for everybody concerned. Extremist groups tend to be well organized. They tend to be networked together in advance. They have resources set aside. They knew who, know who the enemy is, and they're ready to go. And the rest of us in these moments of contingency who aren't extremists, and that's the majority of people, uh, are often wandering around thinking, oh, gee, this is not a very good situation. What do we do now? So much of my argument over the last few years is that uh, it's important in the period of time prior to a shock, whether it's an economic shock or an environmental shock or wh what have you, to begin thinking about and preparing for these moments when there might be a lot of flexibility, when people are scared and angry and looking for answers uh, it would be helpful if, if uh, thoughtful people, non-extremists, had some suggestions for what direction a society could go in to reform, say, its economy or its relationship with the environment. So I think that history and change in complex systems more generally occurs uh, around these moments of contingency that are largely generated by shocks of various kinds, instabilities and crisis. Now, I have a few minutes left, and I'd like to finish by talking about climate change, which has been an issue that's apparently been raised quite a few times. Uh, uh, I want to say a little bit about why I think this is actually where the shocks are going to come from, and that they will have not consequences not just for the human relationship with its natural environment, but profoundly for our global economy. I'm going to go through these slides fairly quickly. Uh, just to give you a sense for the magnitude of the challenge we face and the specific manifestation of that challenge in the Arctic. Uh, what we have here is a graph of temperature in the past, going back to 500 AD up to the present time. This little black line is the temperature change increase over the last, uh, uh, last century and a half or so, uh, and then projections based on models into the future. Uh, uh, don't worry too much about the actual nature of the wiggles and when we had high spots and low spots here. The point that I want to make, is, and it's, it's completely defensible, I'm, I'm afraid that even people who are skeptical about this, these, this modeling and these data would have to admit this, is that uh, if we uh, continue this trajectory according to what the model suggests and we see a warming between, say, two and a half degrees and maybe six degrees Celsius, by the end of this century, we will have moved into a temperature regime globally that is radically different from anything that human, modern human civilization has seen during its evolution over the last two millennia. Uh, when we developed our irrigation systems, our modern economies, when we laid down the plans of our cities, all of that stuff has taken place, all of that activity and economic development has taken place within a, a quite a narrow range of temperatures on the planet, and within a very short period of time, we're moving into a radically different world. That's uh, as the first bit of evidence that I would introduce to suggest that we're likely to see punctuated moments of change, crises, and moments of contingency related to climate in the future. Let me talk a little bit more specifically about the Arctic. This is an, uh, a microwave satellite photograph of the Arctic taken in March 2008. March is when ice extent in the Arctic Basin is uh, largest. Uh, you can see here Greenland, northern Canada, the Canadian archipelago, Alaska and Siberia. Uh, the dark gray represents single year ice. That's ice that's formed just, this, uh, just during the winter of 2007-2008. And this 
uh, light areas, multi-year ice. It's ice that's more than one year old, two, three, four years old, piled up against the northern part of the Canadian archipelago in Greenland. The important point about this is uh, uh, the remarkable change. You probably heard about the decline in the extent of sea ice. The more significant feature of what's happening in the Arctic is the decline in the thickness of sea ice, and particularly the decline in uh, multi-year sea ice. This a white area a decade or 15 years ago would have extended over most of the Arctic basin. So it's extremely vulnerable now to a single hot summer in the Arctic that will melt all of this uh, thin single year ice. Um, as it turns out, I was in the Arctic uh, last week on this ship, the Louis Saint Laurent, which is Canada's most powerful icebreaker. Quite a remarkable piece of engineering and remarkable ship. I spent a week doing a transit in the Northwest Passage with a group of scientists talking about what's happening in the Arctic. Uh, this is just outside Bellet Strait. Uh, in an area that two decades ago would have been jammed with ice. Uh, and now uh, in wide areas, and this is in, uh, uh, this is further south near Coppermine or Kugluktuk. Uh, uh, when we left the ship, the temperature was 17 degrees. Uh, this is a bit further north uh, in Bellet Strait, but the ice is still soft, uh, thin, and breaking up fast. Uh, looking at ice extent, uh, not ice thickness, because it's harder to measure. This is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change projection of the decline of ice extent going out to 2100 in terms of millions of square kilometers of ice. This is the actual observation up to 2008. 2009 was a little bit higher. 2010 it looks like we're going to be down low again. Uh, uh, you can see that we've, it's diverged dramatically from projections. And if you look at the gap between observations and the projection, we are somewhere between 20 and 50 years ahead of model projections in the Arctic. Things are happening very fast. Yes, I know. I have two minutes and 30 seconds right here. <laughs> I'm going to be right on time, Wendy. <laughs> so you might say, does this matter? Really, who, who cares? This is about polar bears, and it's a distant part of the world. Well. I've pushed a lot of climate scientists on this, and, uh, and they, uh, they, they kind of shrug. They say, we think it's going to matter a lot, but we don't know exactly what's going to happen. We think it's going to matter a lot because you're taking an area uh, that represents a significant portion of the surface of the planet. The area above the Arctic Circle represents 9% of the surface area of the Northern Hemisphere, and you're changing that for at least a portion of the year from a highly reflective surface to a a highly absorptive surface because sea water is dark and sea ice is light. We don't know what the implications could be, but one thing that might happen is it could disrupt this particular system, which is called the Hadley cell system. It moves a lot of energy from the equator up to the pole. This Hadley cell here, this vertical circulation, is kind of like a money belt around the, just north of the equator uh, that wraps around the planet and the air circulates like that through the atmosphere. Uh, the polar cell operates, of this three-cell system, the polar cell operates because uh, you have ice here, it makes the air very cold, so it's dense, and it sinks, and that drives the polar cell. You lose that ice, which we may well do by the middle of this decade, at least for a portion of the, of the year. The polar cell might break up, and that will destabilize this interface between the polar cell and the feral cell. And it's along that interface that the jet streams travel. And you know from watching the, the Weather Channel that jet streams are kind of important for things like storm tracks and precipitation patterns far beyond the Arctic. There's already evidence that the jet streams, as the polar cell is weakening, the jet streams are weakening themselves and moving north. You may have noticed how bizarrely the jet streams have started behaving in the last few years. Uh, this can have implications for things potentially a long way away, such as, for example, the monsoon in East Asia. And the monsoon is in East Asia, and this is my last slide. The monsoon in East Asia uh, is critically important for Chinese food production. China needs to produce 450 million tons of grain a year to feed itself. If it had even a 20% shortfall in food production because of, say, some climate-induced drought or storms, not an extreme shortfall, it would have to intervene on the international market for 100 million tons of grain. There are actually only 200 million tons of grain on the international market annually. It would have to absorb 50% of the grain on the international market. That would have uh, 
an effect on food prices, bread prices, and every corner of the planet. Now, the last time we saw a food price shock in 2008, when uh, grain prices doubled or tripled, we saw violence in 60 countries in, in, in the poor parts of the world. Is this really a consideration? My little thing is saying time out, so I'm going to finish off. Uh, there is evidence already that the monsoon is weakening substantially. Uh, and we're seeing, as a result, more precipitation in the southern part of the country because the rain doesn't travel, to, uh, travel further north. The monsoon comes from this direction. So you've heard about the enormous floods in the Yangtze Basin, for example. And we're seeing less precipitation in the northern part of the country because of uh, weaker monsoons. And, and it's that northern area that's the principal wheat growing region for the country. And in the North China Plain, uh, farmers are having to go, in some cases, 200 meters below their farms to try to get uh, water, irrigation water, to make up for the fact that precipitation has declined so much. This is the stuff that's going to have a transformative effect on humankind. And I think it will make any economic crisis we've experienced in the last few years seem trivial by comparison. It will have not only a transformative effect on environmental policy, but on economic policy. So the final point I would make is that where we're going to see these moments of contingency, how they're going to rise, is largely going to be a function of environmental challenges that will then cause us to reconsider some of the ways we've restructured our economies, in particular our addiction to growth. Uh, the, the challenge is the transformation is not going to come from economics to environment, but ultimately from environment to economics. Thank you very much. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to first thank you all for my first Cooch experience. I think for this panel, we're all, we're all first timers. Uh, and it's, uh, it's been a tremendous experience. I've learned so much. And it's wonderful to come to a place that's so relaxed and that can talk about public policy, but also do it with humor. So <laughs> I think that's a great advantage. And uh, I'm not an economist, I'm not a historian, and I'm also not a lecturer or a uh, public speaker. So if you'll indulge me, I'm going to uh, refer to my text and uh, give my presentation that way. Um, what we've heard here about the economic crisis is that uh, we've heard a wonderful mix of conceptual frameworks and specific policy prescriptions. And I think all of those are great. But as Tad outlined, our job here on this panel is to try and look at whether what happened in the economic system has had an impact on whether we've greened our economies. Have we done something so that we're moving towards greening our economies? And the other thing that I am is I am an observer of both politics and policy. And I recognize that the two are sometimes creatively, sometimes maddeningly, and very frustratingly, but always inextricably linked. So I think that when we're looking and considering the financial ecosystem, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the natural ecosystem, we also have to consider our political ecosystem because the global governance stuff that we've heard so much about here is related to our ability to respond to things the way that Ted has described them at moments of contingency. Um, uh, and Jeff is going to talk about shocks as well. So this is, this is actually a wonderful mixed uh, panel, and I think we're going to end up in a very interesting discussion. So as we've heard, the financial crisis shook the global financial, if you'll allow me, ecosystem. And it deepened our understanding that it is indeed an interdependent system, that our economies are linked, that our sovereign actions are not without international consequences, that we can function independently with different systems, but there reaches a point where where what the other does can reverberate through the whole ecosystem. Are you recognizing something that we might think about our natural ecosystem? That's something that's true for the financial system. And I think that if we could grasp this for our natural ecosystem and reflect it in public policy, I think you know, we might be moving closer to where we're trying to get to. And I'll, uh, the other thing I want to uh, talk about is Nick LePan, uh, 
spoke about the resiliency. That's usually a term reserved for ecology, the resiliency of the system. And Nick talked about how we have weakened the underlying resiliency of the whole global financial eco ecosystem over the last couple of years. We responded by recognizing the need for quick and coordinated action through the G8 and the G20, the need to restructure our governance, and we're exploring in a rational and examined way the lessons to to learn, that we can learn to avoid these dynamics in the future. So a question I have for all of you is, could we begin to apply some of these lessons to at least the natural ecosystem and possibly the political ecosystem? And could we, with more objective and rational analysis than we have seen in the last few years, uh, could, if, if we could bring a bit more objectivity and rational analysis, uh, we heard, as Wendy said, almost every other, well, actually every other panel and speakers who were economists or historians raised this issue as something that's weighing in on us. And it's great because climate change is the symbol of the green agenda, is the current symbol of the green agenda. And it's on everyone's list. And it's in our peripheral vision. But as Tad has explained, we sort of need, we need to move with this front and center and we move, need to move it more fully into our economic and other kinds of decision making. So let's use the response to the financial crisis as a bit of a case study. What progress did we make in developing green economies as we were injecting massive stimulus packages into our respective economies? Did we use the intersection of the global economic crisis to advance the energy, transportation, and technological changes that greening our economies would actually require? The answer is, and if you would put the chart up, that'd be great. Uh, the answer is, some of us did, and some of us didn't. So if you look at this chart, it illustrates for us, by country, how much was spent total on stim in stimulus packages. And the, greens, the green internal circles are what percentage of those stimulus packages were spent on green initiatives. Now, those green initiatives could be energy efficient buildings, it could be transportation, it could be green jobs, low carbon vehicles, water treatment, energy infrastructure. Every country had a different mix of things, but there was, there was an, an early analysis done of how much of it was spent on green initiatives. And you can see that in Canada, we spent roughly 8% of a massive stimulus package, one time, uh, that now leaves us in a deficit where we're not going to have a lot of walking around money for the next five years. One time opportunity, we spent 8% of that on things which overlapped uh, with green infrastructure. The US is closer to 15%, China is approximately 35%, the EU is 65%, and South Korea is closer to 85%. So, watershed moment or wasted opportunity. In this particular example for Canada, it was a wasted opportunity because we did, we injected massive amounts of stimulus into our economy and we are going to be paying down the deficit for years to come so we have less opportunity to do this in the future. We could have overlapped these things and we didn't. Um, the other point that I'd like to make about this is that I think that this also tells us something about competitiveness and innovation. Because when we talk about greening the economy or climate change, we tend to come at it from a, where this is the environmental lens and it's got nothing to do with our economic space or our economic future or our uh, growth of our economies. But I think we need to shift that perspective because if you look at uh, what it means for China and the US, so these are percentages, but if you take the, Chi the Chinese and the US uh, investment in green infrastructure, that's over $300 billion invested in those two economies uh, in technologies and infrastructure. And South Korea is betting the farm on green, and at the same time, as Tad allude, alluded to, they are lowering the carbon intensity of their economies. Okay, And it's a difference between a short game and a long game view. Because the long game view, we are moving towards low carbon, low consumption systems. 
And a short game view says immediate stimulus and we'll deal with the rest of it later. But I'll come back to this in a minute. The other thing I think that's worth pointing out is that these investments are not domestic. I think it's false for us to think about these green investments as only domestic investments. They are investments in R&D, in commercialization, and potentially in export technologies that we will find ourselves buying down the road. Um, the greener circles, I would argue, also represent a parad paradigm shift. As Wenren Jang told us yesterday, the old paradigm of pollute first and clean up later is being traded for one that recognizes that energy efficiency and resource productivity, doing more with less, are actually successful economic strategies. That's a paradigm shift. The old one said successful economic strategy is build and defer, deal with the cleanup later, it's a cost of doing business, we'll see it later. And now, as when you're talking about the volumes, as Wenren was describing to us yesterday, uh, when you're talking the, about the volumes of buying refrigerators or cars or changing, uh, changing the personal infrastructure and doing it at that level and volume, we have to use uh, we have to be much more efficient with the resources that we use. Uh, it also looks long term, okay? So it, some of these stimulus packages consider economic and standard of living realities that look out to 2020 and 2040. But we haven't shifted in this country yet. We haven't adopted this paradigm and unfortunately in our minority parliament, we have tangled greening the economy up with where you stand on climate change, ideologically. And we have effectively paralyzed some of the innovation and investment in clean technology that Roger and Anne talked, about, uh, talked to us about as being necessary. We have made investments, but as you can see from the chart, not enough to complete glo compete globally in an area where we have natural, res natural advantages, natural resources and natural advantages. That's good for the... Um, and as I said, now that we've spent down the stimulus and are facing five years of def deficit, we will have less to go around for the next five years. And we, uh, we agreed a few nights ago that drift was not a strategy, but neither is deferral. And these issues uh, are not linear. This is the other thing about that's similar between my observations and Tad's. Uh, they're not linear. Uh, if we don't deal with the financial ecosystem over here and then come along at some point later and deal with the natural ecosystem. It's not going to work like that. Uh, these are over, there are overlapping shocks. There's been a shock in the financial ecosystem, but there are shocks coming in the environmental ecosystem, and uh, linear thinking won't work. The pace of change and crisis is accelerating, and the pressures are cumulative. So our time frames to solve them are compressing, and I think we have a challenge, <laughs> the urgency of which I don't think we've actually quite grasped, and we certainly haven't done it yet in our politics and our public policy. So as Margaret McMillan suggested earlier, movement on climate change is not an art article of faith. And I would like to suggest that we're continuing to weaken the underlying resilience of our natural and our economic ecosystem because over the last 20 years we have made it a stalemated battleground for ideology. This is not a uniquely Canadian problem. The US is feeling the pinch right now in the Senate in their inability to pass climate or energy legislation for that matter and in the lead up to the midterms. And it's there in the global debate. I was in Copenhagen. I can tell you that it's certainly there in, in, uh, in the global debate on where we go on this. But we should start untangling it at home so that we can better participate in solving what is, after all, a global problem. Climate change is a global problem. If we can recognize that our, our financial ecosystem is a global financial ecosystem and that we have responsibilities beyond our own borders, surely we can recognize this about our natural ecosystem once we have so many signals telling us that this is the case. Uh, but this is a complex issue. <laughs> I call climate change. Uh, the mother of all horizontal issues. I mean, this is so complex and so difficult, and it's, it's always challenging to figure out what's the best way in. And as you can tell from uh, Jennifer's passion yesterday, uh, 
This is also an intergenerational challenge, that the time frame on which we consider these issues is really very important. And it's going to be hard. <laughs> we, we're not really having a conversation in this country about the, the tough issues. Climate change is about energy. There's just no getting around that climate change is about energy, and I'm going to leave this space for Jeff, and then we can get into the debate when we, when we get into the, the session. But we have some hard challenges in our federal provincial system with, as Alex Himmelfarb call it, called it, our totems related to uh, a national energy program, or we avoid conversations about energy because of uh, what is now, what, a 30-year-old storyline. We need to modernize our narratives and bring them forward so that we can have necessary conversations. Um, it's going to require leadership, and I don't think we've seen that. I'm, and I'm not just talking about Canada. I think Barack Obama and the U.S. is really wrestling with this right now, and I think we see it in other jurisdictions. I mean, Kevin Run Rudd is gone. Gordon Brown is gone. I was looking back through some transcripts of the people who spoke in Copenhagen, and a few of those leaders who were very passionate about this issue are, are not in office anymore. So this is where there's an intersection with our political ecosystem. But the global financial crisis may have given us some practice for what is required now. And to use, uh, to use Tad's analogy, this may be a moment of contingency, a moment for us to look at what would we do in anticipating what that shock would be. Nick LePen told us on Friday that Canada did well in the financial crisis, less badly, if you're Alex Himmelfarb, uh, uh, than others through a combination of good luck, good management, and regulation. That we had a distinctly Canadian approach that was set, some of which was set in place some 20 years ago, that ultimately protected us from the deepest impacts and I would argue that our energy and natural resource assets also helped us in the financial crisis as well. Perhaps we could remember this as we, uh, as we design a distinctly Canadian approach now on energy and climate change. Of course, mindful of our positioning in North America and in a global economy, but I think we are going to need to look at this for what is, what is the right Canadian position. The financial cr crisis also required a global governance system, and after Copenhagen, we certainly don't have that, not even agreement on the ultimate form on energy and climate change. Earlier this year, Stephen Harper called for us to start thinking about enlightened sovereignty, that all nations could change, should change their policies for the global good, that there was an interest beyond that of the independent nation state, and in this instance, he was talking about financial the financial system, banking, and trade barriers. But it applies equally on these issues. We also need to understand that the climate change negotiations are about the economy. They are about global financing, they are about technology, and they are increasingly about trade. One of the things I came home from Copenhagen with was that what keeps the US and China at the global climate change negotiating table is the underlying threat of trade barriers. We need to understand that as we uh, move forward, and we need to understand how sophisticated uh, and complex this is so that we develop a similarly sophisticated and uh, respectful of complexity <laughs> uh, response for Canada. Uh, the climate agenda is also starting to blend with the role of other global institutions, like the G8 and the G20. Beyond the stuff that's been covered, all, all of the, this is obviously not my area of expertise, but all of the banking and uh, financial infrastructure, global financial infrastructure that's been discussed at the last G8 and G20 meetings, the other largest issue that's been addressed is, they've said, Climate change and energy are an important part of recovery. There's been big parts of the G8 and the G20 agenda that recognize that this is a next wave issue, but at the, at the moment, it's only at the level of rhetoric. It's not at the level of action, and it's not at the level of moving it in as a core consideration. It's also, uh, it's also part of, uh, it's, it's bleeding into the WTO's jurisdiction, and we need to sort all of this out.
So let's understand that greening our economies means a move towards low carbon and low consumption systems. And we're doing it because the carrying capacity of the planet is limited. The carrying capacity of the planet is limited. This is actually more widely understood than we, than we often give credit for. I can tell you that every industry in the natural resources sectors knows this already, and they're working to maximize efficiencies. There are a new breed of clean tech entrepreneurs that understand this and expect to capitalize on it. And we as consumers are beginning to understand it, but I, I would argue that none of us yet are fully reflecting a deep understanding of this, an intergenerational understanding of this in our actions. We need to understand that we can no longer separate our economic and natural ecosystems. It was a myth, it was a myth that we ever could. We cannot separate our economic and our natural ecosystems. And now our political e ecosystem needs to provide leadership, but first we're going to need to change, sh we're going to need to change or shake things up. So watershed moment or wasted opportunity, I would, I would say wasted opportunity to green our economy, but watershed moment, not yet. Thank you. Finding the nature of a disease is usually viewed as a precondition for discovering a cure. And so it is that knowing the nature of the last recession is generally viewed as important, if for no other reason than guiding us to avoid the same pitfalls of what got us into this recession in the first place. If you listen to the pundits, the finance ministers, the central banks, CNBC, CNN, the deepest global recession on record in the post-war era was really a financial crisis, financial crisis whose origins lie with a whole bunch of leveraged, unsellable property in places like Cleveland. Well. No one has to tell me about the impact of the subprime mortgage crisis on the banking industry. Why the hell do you think I'm an author? But there's a whole big difference between blowing up investment banks and blowing up the global economy. I guess what happened to the investment banks is that even the most prudent Canadian chartered banks who would not lend money to people who otherwise got money from subprime mortgages found that at the same time these banks that wouldn't lend money bought billions of dollars of securities called CLOs, CDOs, fancy derivative securities that promised to pay maybe a third of a percentage point more than a US Treasury bond or a government of Canada bond. But what was actually behind these securities was the monthly mortgage payments from all these subprime mortgages. So then, of course, when people couldn't make those payments, then alas, those billions of dollars had to be written down. But as I say, and I guess the question would be, well, why did financial institutions that were so prudent in terms of managing who they would give mortgages to so lax about the nature of securities that they were buying? Well, it was because these securities, these subprime collateralized mortgages, were deemed AAA by rating agencies. But what banks forgot was who pays rating agencies? <laughs> Rating agencies are paid by the firms that issue securities. In economics, we call that moral hazard. 
In investment banking, it's called shit happens. <laughs> but again, I say there's, there's a big difference between blowing up investment banks and blowing up the global economy. Maybe, just maybe, there was something else going on. Something else that would have been an alternative to the Cleveland hypothesis of the world economy. Something else that would have answered the question that indeed if it was distressed US property markets like Cleveland that were the epicenter of this financial crisis come recession, why did economies in Western Europe and Japan have much deeper recessions than the US? And why did those economies go into recession even before Cleveland went into recession? As I say, maybe there was something bigger going on. Like, for example, the world's largest energy shock, where oil prices went from around circa $35 in 2004 to $148 circa 2008. I say that because, in fact, every other oil shock, none of which had been anywhere near as large as this oil shock, even in inflation-adjusted terms, all of the other past oil shocks led to huge recessions. The OPEC oil shock in 1973, the second OPEC oil shock that led to a double-dip recession in 79 and 82. In 1991, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait and left half of those countries' oil fields on fire, oil spiked to what was then the record high of $41, creating another recession. In fact, the only global sort of recession that didn't have oil's footprints on it was the Asian financial meltdown in 1998 that didn't even wash ashore the economies of the major oil-consuming economies. Why indeed, if all these other oil shocks were the authors of what had been, previous to today, the world's deepest recessions, why wouldn't the largest oil shock of them all be the obvious culprit for the state of where the world economy has been in in the last two years? The question is not purely of academic interest, because in the process of bailing out financial institutions, in the process of bailing out obsolete auto companies. We have racked up the largest deficits. Wall Street talks about the pigs, Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Spain. But Wall Street need not look across the Atlantic to see pigs, because America is the biggest pig of them all. America's $1.5 trillion deficit is the biggest as a percentage of its GDP since World War II. And the outstanding volume of marketable debt of US Treasury dwarfs the outstanding debt of marketable debt in Portugal, Spain, Ireland, or Italy. The fact of the matter is that politicians have spent the taxpayers' why. We are now all deeply indebted no matter where we are, even in fiscally virtuous Canada, where it was sacrosanct to run surpluses, we have the largest deficits we've seen in the post-war period. Well, what does that imply about our fiscal flexibility going forward? What happens if I'm right and they're wrong? If this really was an energy crisis, what does it say about our ability to deal with future energy crises? And when oil is already trading at $80 a barrel, this is not an academic question. Turn the clock back three years ago, and today's recession-scarred oil price would have been an, a world record high. Now it trades when most of the economies in the so-called G7 haven't even got back to the levels they were before the recession began. Where do you think? oil will be trading in the near future. I think oil will be trading at triple-digit oil prices within the next 12 months. But unfortunately, the next time that we hit that price, we won't be able to turn on the spigot of government spending. We won't be able to run up those massive deficits. In fact, we'll be doing the opposite. We'll be paying them back. Fiscal breaks are being applied all around the world. Countries like Greece 
are being asked to sacrifice 10% of its GDP at the altar of deficit reduction, which is why bond traders are shorting Greek bonds because they know that no rational population is going to make that sacrifice. Other economies like Portugal and Spain and even Great Britain are being asked to give up 6 to 7% of its GDP. And the only reason that Obama was asking his G7 partners at the recent fiasco in Toronto to increase their spending is because Congress is not going to allow him to increase his spending. Indeed, Congress also wants to clamp on the fiscal breaks. So the problem, of course, is that not only have we used up our fiscal latitude, but in fact, we are going to be shifting in gears, going from akin to having your foot floored on the accelerator to slamming those brakes. How long we'll keep those brakes on remains to be seen. History, believe me, says that it is not deflation that is the dancing partner to these deficits. It is reflation. Every time, and I don't mean the reflation of Argentina and Brazil's, just look at Uncle Sam's record in the post-war period. Any time that we have seen deficits even half the size in relation to the economy and GDP, Uncle Sam has turned on the printing presses. Coming out of World War II, inflation in 1947 quickly rose to 17%. Uncle Sam rose round up huge deficits in the Korean War. Inflation went from minus 1% to 9%. And during the Vietnam War, when U.S. deficits also went to above 5 to 6 percent of GDP, once again the printing presses were turned on, and once again inflation made a triumphant return to double-digit territory. But before seeing that, there is no question that in the next couple of years, what we are going to do, the price we are going to pay for misdiagnosing this recession is to make the next recession worse. Not only have we run up these massive deficits, but what did we do with these deficits? Who did we bail out? We bailed out Wall Street. And even worse, we bailed out the auto companies. And when you consider that 60% of all the oil consumed in North America is consumed as a motor fuel, we basically boiled out, bailed out the oil companies. You know, it's not a coincidence that last year there were, for the first time in the post-war period, four million fewer automobiles on the road in the United States than there were before. Because in a world in which world oil supply is no longer growing, consuming oil becomes a zero-sum game. What that means is that every year, if there are going to be 13 million new drivers in China coming onto the market, and the Chinese vehicle market has already surpassed the U.S. market, then it means that somewhere, somehow, 13 million other drivers have to get off the road. Guess where that somewhere else is? That somewhere else is right here. That 4 million net loss of cars on the road is the, only the first step. We're going to see 40 to 50 million fewer vehicles in North America over the next 10 years. Is that the kind of market outlook the taxpayer should be investing in? But lo, indeed, the taxpayer has invested in it, and no more heavily than in our own home province here in our fiscally prudent Ontario. You know, GM got $50 billion from the U.S. Treasury, and GM and Chrysler got $14 billion from the Canadian and Ontario taxpayer. $14 billion. My God, that's over 50% of the entire annual corporate tax take of those jurisdictions. And what did we get in return? We got an equity stake in a market that's probably going to shrink by 20%. I know what I would do if I was the president of General Motors. I'd take the $50 billion from Obama, and I'd take the $14 billion from Canada, and I'd go build me some car plants in China. But I'm sure he promised not to do that. <laughs> Nevertheless, GM is spending almost twice as much in car capacity in China as it is in North America, and so should it. 
because that's where the market's going to be. So not only have we racked up these huge deficits, but what we've bought is propped up companies that are soon going to become technologically obsolete. Now, I've been asked to talk a bit about carbon. And of course, carbon is the flip side of energy. It's not surprising that when we find out where emissions are coming from, they're no longer coming from the old carbon retrograde like Canada and the United States and Western Europe, because those places isn't where coal is being burned, or for that matter, even where oil is being burned anymore. China long surpassed coal consumption in the United States. It will surpass oil consumption in North America within the next 10 years. So the challenge no longer is a local one, but a global one. Unfortunately, global frameworks like Copenhagen don't work when half of the people there want to emit more, not less, and have every right to want to emit more. Oil consumption in China on a per capita basis is one-tenth of what it is in Canada or the United States. In India, one twentieth. Of course, it's not oil that's driving their emissions, it's coal. But unlocking the power in the seams of coal is the way that we supplied energy to our industrial revolution. Why should it not to theirs? There is no moral higher ground. However, there is this reality. It may well have been Western Europe and North America that took us from 280 parts to 390 parts part per carbon. But it will be emissions from the emerging markets that threaten to put us over some critical tipping point. Our problem is this. We cannot put a price on our own carbon emissions. And until we put a price on carbon emissions, this is simply an exercise in looking good and doing dead. But to put a price on carbon emissions, we cannot put a ask our producers to pay twice. We cannot ask our producers to pay for their own carbon emissions and then pay again as they lose market share to imports from countries that won't pay for their emissions. That won't abate carbon emissions. That's not a plan for ecological sustainability. That's an exercise in economic suicide. And that's why there is no support yet for a price on putting, uh, putting a price on carbon emissions. There would be, there would be, if at the same time we imposed a carbon tariff, which means that if you want to supply or sell goods in our market, then you must pay the same price for the carbon that you emitted to produce that good as our producers are going to be asked to pay for their emissions. And then something will fundamentally change, something that people like Jim Flaherty hasn't figured out, that raising the environmental bar doesn't send jobs away. It brings them back home. The average manufacturing or steel plant in Canada emits one-third less than the average plant in China, simply because 80% of power in China is coal-powered-fired, 10% in Canada. That means absolutely nothing if the price of emissions is zero. But all of a sudden, if the price of emissions is $70 to $80 a ton, you've changed cost curves. And that shift in cost curves redefines economic geography. All those carbon-spewing plants didn't go over to China because they were more carbon efficient. All of those carbon-spewing plants went over to China because the wage rate was lower, and if carbon emissions are free and oil costs 30 to $40 a barrel, it's only about wage rates. But throw in $150, $200 a barrel and the transport costs that that engenders, and throw in 60 to $70 a ton carbon emissions, and all of a sudden, a lot of those long-lost manufacturing jobs come home. That's something our politicians haven't yet got the message, that raising the environmental bar, putting a price on carbon emissions, actually bolsters our economy, doesn't jeopardize our economy. 
But it won't bolster our economy until we do one thing. I'm an economist. Prices is my religion. We start paying for carbon emissions, we're going to emit less. Thank you very much.